pretty sure that's why we have the King James Bible. Yeah, I think there's there's a YouTube. Okay, so recording starting. Let me share my screen again. And then let me get the chat up. Okay. okay. That works okay. Great. So this week we are going to be learning about fear and trembling, Kierkegaard. Um, we all read it. Actually, you know what? I, I want to do like a brief test, so cancel that. Um, by show of hands and like no judgments or whatever, I'm just curious, who did the reading? Oh. Okay, like everybody. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. That's really good to hear. Um, so let me go back to sharing my screen. It's nice to know that you guys are keeping up. That's really good. Kierkegaard is Atticus's fave. Kierkegaard is awesome, um, especially in Fear and Trembling. He has some other works that are questionable but they are actually questionable, not questionable completely in the sense of, hmm, I'm a little morally curious about that, um, which you could totally interpret, um, say like Seducer's Diary in that way. Um, but Kierkegaard also published under a bunch of pseudonyms uh, in Fear and Trembling, he's Johannes de Silencio, John of the Silence. Um, and, uh, and so there, there are charitable interpretations of Kierkegaard that have it that he's being an ironist when he's being cringy under a pseudonym. Um, but that'll be something that I bring up. Um, overall general impressions. Uh, again, I can't see if, actually would somebody raise a hand to use the, thing? I want to know if it like pops up through my, oh yeah, good. Thank you, Scott. Um, does anybody have like any initial comments or like concerns? Did, did we like the reading? Did we hate the reading? Did we think that it was a nice romantic reading and helped the doom vibes? Dallas. I was just kind of confused almost the whole time I was reading it personally. Fair, totally fair. <laughs> um, so that's, that's good that you're here at lecture. Hopefully that'll get cleared up a little bit. It, it is a dense read. Um, he's not an easy writer to get through and um, he uses a bunch of concepts that he develops in all of his other works. And so there's a whole lot of terms of art that we'll be defining and we'll spend actually most of our time today defining and, and working out the structure of um, Kierkegaard's prose. and. It, these, the, this section that I gave you of Fear and Trembling is prose, um, which is important to note. So the, the book is split up uh, into two halves. Um, after the preface, um, which is a really cool um, critique of like uh, skepticism and scientism and um, the like, uh, what do you call it? Like it's, it's like haughty dogmatism of, uh, high-minded people. Um, it's a cool little critique. Um, after that, you get uh, about 50 pages of um, like lyrical prose that describe what Kierkegaard feels. It, it, he, he describes himself as a poet. Um, he is maybe not a man of infinite resignation, but of resignation uh, and takes something like a half step towards faith, which may make no sense to you now, but you know, we've read it. So um, at least, you know, like he takes half a step towards faith. He, he considers himself to be a poet of love in this, right? Um, which is to, to communicate um, with one's uh, aesthetic nature, which we'll talk about um, in, in a way that communicates with others' aesthetic natures. Um, and, and this is the whole first half of the book is an aesthetic um, prose um, meant to express what the second half of the book argues for. Now, the, the second half of the book is broken up into three problemata. Um, is one, is there a teleological suspension of the ethical? Two, is there an absolute duty to God? And three, was it ethically defensible of Abraham to conceal his undertaking from Sarah, his wife? 
um, from Elizir and from his son Isaac. Um, and it's in these problemata that you get an actual like argument structure of what he expresses in the, the initial outpourings. Now in the argument structure, um, Hegel doesn't argue like we argue today in uh, a regular philosophy class or in any field of analytic philosophy. Um, he is a Hegelian, a stout Hegelian. And so uses the Hegelian form of argument uh, to express his ideas and uh, it's very confusing and um, it wouldn't be fruitful to have read. So we get all the, the content out of these initial outpourings in kind of a fun to read way, even if it's less um, argumentatively rigorous. Um, just, you know, if you really enjoyed this, read the second half of the book. And uh, if you didn't, then you'll just have to suffer this lecture and never have to look at it again. Okay, so fear and trembling. Um, uh oh, my clicker has been. Okay, fear and trembling. So, some recap. So far, we've discussed the problem of being, right? Existence preceding essence. This is true for Kierkegaard as well. Um, and in a lot of ways, Kierkegaard is, uh, if not like the father of uh, existentialism, he's called like the grandfather, right? Because he is living in a highly religious, highly Christian world and um, is among the first uh, thinkers, authors, poets even to uh, take on the problem of being from a Christian perspective. And so tries to um, adjudicate uh, his, his own intuitions of existence preceding essence and the problems that come with that, right? Like my being is all of a sudden a problem. I recognize myself as a particular uh, soul in the world with certain ethical duties, and yet there is uh, a universal power greater than me, that is God, who, uh, whose will I must follow, even when it's in contradiction with my own being. Um, and I need a way to solve that problem, because if existence precedes essence, that is a problem, and it's a genuine one, where if essence precedes existence, um, you just say, well, the will of God is what's good regardless, right? Um, doesn't matter uh, one way or the other what God says. If God says it, so it is willed. Um, you know, Dixie or whatever Ivan says at the end of The Grand Inquisitor. Um, but for Kierkegaard, it is a genuine problem to cope with uh, this possible contradiction of his own sense of what ought to be and this infinite ultimately more powerful um, uh, will of God and, and what it deems must be. And in some cases, biblical Job, uh, Adam uh, eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge, um, Job uh, continuing to have faith and believe in God in spite of all the horrific, awful things that happened to him, uh, and uh, principally Abraham, right? These are characters uh, with whom the the ethical life that they live is put into contradiction with the will of God. And so this is sort of a problem, right? So we've also talked about the absurd and its effect on living. And this was essentially in The Stranger. Now we won't see the problem that Camus um, is specifically trying to resolve until we get to the myth of Sisyphus, which is the problem of suicide, right? So The Stranger is uh, the, the feeling half of the answer to the problem of suicide. The myth of Sisyphus is the um, explicit uh, argumentative and often lyrical form of a response to the problem of suicide, how one uh, who is awake to or recognizes the absurdity of existence uh, avoids killing themselves uh, and or committing philosophical suicide is a different kind of suicide, uh, absconding from reason, basically. Um, so the absurd is also a problem. It's a theme like we've seen quite a lot um, and even with, with Ivan and dealing with the absurd, he uh, turns his back on God, even if God does exist. Uh, it doesn't matter. Ivan, in, it, for the sake of the absurd, uh, returns his ticket, right? Um, and we've also, with Ivan, talked about resignation and rebellion against the absurd, right? So not just living in it, as Marceau does, um, uh, and not just the theoretical problem, right, as the problem of being represents, but um, the, an active solution to the state or condition of absurdity in our lives and how we cope and live and deal, right? Uh, and for Ivan, this is to rebel against uh, he who would 
uh, put us in such a condition that is God um, or otherwise uh, be resigned to the absurd and so do something about it, um, which is the Grand Inquisitor passage. Okay. So um, what is the absurd and how do we cope with it? This is the big question um, of our existentialists with the exception of Nietzsche. Nietzsche doesn't specifically deal with the absurd, but he takes nihilism as his problem, as his life's goal to like get rid of. Um, and, and so it's easy to read Nietzsche as an existentialist. You, you ought not to. Nietzsche isn't an existentialist, but his arguments and his prose, what he um, says is um, uh, directly complementary with um, this problem of absurdity. Because if we are in the absurd, which the existentialists will have us believe that we are, um, then we can cope with it or we can succumb to it. To succumb to it is to be a nihilist, right? To allow it to overtake us, to um, cease to, to allow our own personal texture to take grip in the world. Um, and this is the problem that, that Nietzsche deals with, the problem of nihilism and how um, he answers that question we'll look at next week. Um, but for now, at least the absurd and how we cope with it has been like the big problem of, of our conversations in class. So our readings have also gotten progressively more Gnostic and Christian. That's sort of how I structured it. Um, we start uh, abstractly. We move into uh, an atheistic perspective, the stranger, because the, the whole class is sort of scoped around understanding Camus and the French existence. Camus is my favorite. I, I think Simone de Beauvoir is probably the best, um, like structurally, theoretically, like like the, what she argues and how she says what she does. She is the the most like acutely precise and probably best equipped to, to deal with this question, how to cope with the absurd um, in conversation with Sartre and, um, and Camus and, and other existentialists as well. But Camus is my favorite. So that's why I scoped the class around him. So we start with an atheistic perspective of, of this question, um, just to give us a sense of what the absurd is and how Merceau copes with it. Um, and then uh, we, uh, start to answer more directly, right? And one answer that remains Christian and, or at least Gnostic the, uh, and, and theologically driven is Ivan's, though um, it's a way of like sinning your way to Jesus, right? It's kind of intense and harsh and uh, uh, eschews most uh, common moral sensibilities of uh, Western Christian theology um, of the Abrahamic tradition, traditions generally. Um, and yet is Dostoevsky's own unique sort of strange form of uh, Orthodox Christianity. Um, and now in Kierkegaard, we have a really strictly um, Christian answer to this question. How can one believe in God? And it need not be Christian, right? But uh, Kierkegaard is a Christian, so that's the tradition that he's gonna be using. But I don't think that at least in what is developed in Fear and Trembling, one needs to be a Christian. I think it's enough to um, believe in God uh, at least in the same kind of God, right? This triomni one that we talked about um, last week, uh, omnipotent, omniscient, omni uh, omnibenevolent. Um, as long as, as it can be made consistent to believe in God uh, and uh, the absurd, Kierkegaard gives us an answer to how to work those two ideas together. Um, the problem of evil with the existence of God is its own issue. Um, the problem of the absurd with the existence of God is a, a totally other issue. The problem of evil assumes uh, certain moral frameworks of categories of good and bad, of what counts as evil and what doesn't, right? The absurd is something very different. The absurd is uh, the, the condition that underlies uh, being, but is incomprehensible to the understanding. And if there's this gap between what is what it is to, to is to be, um, and uh, what it is to understand, which is our modus operandi of being at all. Um, that absurdity in conjunction with God's existence is also a problem. And this is the problem that Kierkegaard is taking up, right? As I expressed earlier, this problem of uh, the one and the whole, the universal and the particular, right? Um, interacting with one another and how you adjudicate the problems between them. Uh, as it turns out for Kierkegaard, it's gonna be through faith. So for God, or for Marceau, God is more than just an afterthought. It's a waste of precious life, right? Just 
don't, don't waste my time, priest. Get out of here. I, I'm trying to like live the last moments of my life and um, your promises of an afterlife only force me to do so less authentically, to get less of the, the juice and the blood out of the, the final moments of my existence. For Ivan, God's existence is unacceptable, but his God's capital, his right mission is not. So what God says is good, but what God has done to us is not. And so return his ticket and do the work for God, um, Grand Inquisitor, right? And for Johannes de Silentio, um, the pseudonym of Kierkegaard in Fear and Trembling, um, faith in God is how one pro properly coasts with the absurd. In fact, accepting the absurd into oneself, right? Which, which Merceau might call uh, opening oneself to the cool indifference of the world. Something like this uh, is what Kierkegaard means by the movement of faith, which we'll talk about at the end of the lecture. But we have to work up to that, which is a, an acceptance of the absurd, of bringing in the absurd, receiving the absurdity of existence and in its receipt, um, finding salvation or not salvation in the sense of like, I'm going to heaven salvation, but salvation from the resignation and suffering of um, that, that, that is co-occurrent with the state of absurdity. Okay. So through faith, being is not a problem, but an achievement. Okay. So who is Kierkegaard? Well, hello. Is that working? Okay, it is. He was a Danish dude who never left Copenhagen. I think he left like three or four times in his life, and then he only went a few towns over. He just like hung out, didn't do all that much um, travel. Uh, though, interestingly, he says in um, Fear and Trembling here that if he knew a night of faith in his life, he would go and like dote on this person and follow their every footstep and do everything that they would, I, I think would like really irritate the night of faith. Um, but who knows, you know, it, it's, it's his concept. Maybe nights of faith are amenable to stalkers. Who knows? Um, but Kierkegaard never knew a night of faith. And so uh, avoided them or, or avoided leaving Copenhagen. He didn't avoid them. Um, he's a Christian a theologian and a poet. And interestingly for, a philosopher Christian living around the time that he did in the 1800s, he wasn't taken to task as far as I could find in, in my own research by the church. Um, and a lot of theologians really like Kierkegaard. Um, so even though he's dealing with a tough problem and giving his own strange theological interpretations of Abraham, like non-standard interpretations, he's not like labeled a heretic or, or dealt with uncharitably as say like Dostoevsky, it, Dostoevsky is treated uncharitably by um, the Orthodox faith and Christians generally because he's like so ludicrously strange as one. Um, he probably doesn't even count as one, um, though he would call himself one. So, so there is like a foil in, in these two. But, but with Kierkegaard, there's, um, I think, enough consistency and overlap that um, those who are also similarly inclined to the problem of being find um, and are Christian or or um, Gnostic believers, right? Um, and when I say Gnostic, I don't mean Gnosticism, which is a, a kind of Christianity that uh, says, screw your dogma church. I, I don't need to like go through the sacraments and say our father or whatever. Um, I, I'm all about mysticism and spiritual practice. Uh, it, Gnostic, I mean, in like the Latin root sense. So it just means believer, right? So there's agnosticism, A is the Latin root for not, right? So not believer, ag agnostic but it doesn't mean atheist so a theist is to be like a, a like follower of god um and atheist is not follower of god so opposite of that is you know atheist um so gnostic in the sense of like belief and i, I use that word because i don't want to commit myself to uh, in explaining this a particularly christian theology i think gnosticism is like as belief in a god in whatever form is sufficient for what Kierkegaard is doing, at least in fear and trembling. Now, when you look at the rest of his works, I think Christianity takes more of a direct role, um, but at least here, uh, charitably, Gnosticism is, is enough. So that, that's why I use that word. Okay. Um, grandfather existentialism, talked about that. Was he an ironist? Was he cringy? Both. Yeah. I mean, in Diary of a Seducer, his main character is the cringiest dude ever. Don't like, just don't read that book unless you um, are going to be a Kierkegaard scholar. It's, it's really tough. The guy is so narcissistic and weird, convoluted thinking, and he's uh, like a manipulator, but then he 
like justifies his manipulation with all these philosophical ramblings. It, that, a charitable interpretation of this character is that he's an aesthete, an aesthetic, a person in the aesthetic form of life, which is uh, uh, an impoverished form of life, though better than normal. It's, it's impoverished from an ethical life and ultimately a religious life. Um, and it, it might just be Kierkegaard being ironic, saying like, look, this guy is a hero, but he's not actually a hero. And he used a pseudonym, so who, who knows? Um, he perpetually used pseudonyms for like the first half of his life. I think he starts publishing under his own name about halfway through his career. Um, and he remains ambiguously responsible for his writings, their meanings, their upshots, their arguments. And this is a whole slew of debate in the secondary literature, right? What, who, who was it that wrote these and, and what does that person represent? What do they mean? Um, this sort of thing. So I've talked about or hinted at the aesthetic, the ethical and the religious. Kierkegaard's philosophical life project, this um, theme that we see in all of his works uh, is this development, these stages of life. And I say stages of life um, in an abstract sort of way, I suppose. Um, it's not like stages of life, like being a toddler, being a teenager, being a young adult, an adult, and then like a senior citizen. It's not like that. It's not like you start out aesthetic and then you become ethical and then you eventually end up religious. It's not that. It's that, um, this is showing, okay, good. Um, it's that there, there are stages of like uh, personal development, growth as a human. Um, and any of them is an achievement though one follows from the next. And so the goal is to be a religious person, which isn't like, oh, hey, you go to church every day, religious. No, it's like a technical term religious and same with ethical and same with ascetic. Um, and I mentioned that, that Hey, or Kierkegaard is a Hegelian. Um, for the Hegelians, uh, the spirit, which is kind of everything, but for the, the human spirit, human consciousness is a progressive development of different stages uh, where it, it eventually like breaks out into like full openness of spirit. It's all very confusing and strange, um, but it's a similar sort of idea with Kierkegaard that you're spiritually developing as you um, move through these, what I've called stages of life. Okay. So the aesthetic stage of life, if one is an aesthete, um, the aesthetic stage of existence is characterized by the following immersion and sensuous existence, a kind of, uh, if not hedonism, then uh, adventure, right? Um, a valorization of possibility over actuality. One, uh, the aesthete loves uh, uh, unrequited love, because um, love unrequited is always possible and, and never scorned. Um, there's egotism, and this is just like describing the character of uh, Diary of a Seducer. Fragmentation of a state of subject, uh, fragmentation of the subject of experience. Um, so one's uh, life is fragmented uh, by the sensuous aesthetic uh, appearances or representations that, that every moment or if not moment then every stage of life is almost distinct from from the rest because they're like Marceau non-causally connected Marceau in the the first half of the stranger is uh, very much uh, consistent with this description of an aesthete right um, and for the same reason uh, that he his character seems fragmented right and this like every sentence is his own universe same thing that that's sort of what this means um, and then there's a nihilistic wielding of irony and skepticism. This is what Kierkegaard would call uh, bourgeoisie philistinism. Um, so like this uh, disdain for morals and culture, there's a kind of cynicism um, that, that you get by being too smart, you know, like you, you get haughty. Um, and so there's this nihilistic uh, wielding of irony and skepticism, which in the preface, if you guys read the preface, um, uh, Kierkegaard mentions and like at least points out and says, aren't you so silly? Um, and then flight from boredom, right? Um, we might think of, uh, what is his name? Rudolph in Madame Bovary, Madame Bovary's lover. Um, this guy uh, goes from woman to woman and uses him up as, as, uh, and, and for a while is interested in Madame Bovary. And as soon as she bores him, she wants to, it's like when she wants to marry him is when he gets bored. It's like, oh, okay, too serious. See you later. And so runs to another town and buys a new house. And, you know, like the cycle repeats. Um, 
I think his name is Rudolph. We got a question from Sarah as well. Could you explain the fragmentation of the subject of experience a bit more? Um, maybe. Uh, so what we'll see later, I have a quote in here, the, the deeper natures, he says in, in this work, um, remain stable, they don't change themselves, they're true to who they are, right? We, we have a soul, right? He, he's a Christian, he's a, a theist, a not, 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 he believes in God, so he also believes in soul, and, and if there's this thing that that we are that we're supposed to be that that is our essence what what makes us us the um the the being that we are has certain principles and um uh these principles are important and it's important that we live authentically within those principles that we're exercising our free will um responsibly to what it means to be who we are and we're not lying to ourselves, being duplicitous. Um, for the athlete, none of this matters. It just matters that you're having experiences, that you're feeling, that you are uh, living passionately. And it doesn't matter who you are uh, from one social gathering to the next, just so long as you're able to milk the most passion and, and aesthetic power, the most beauty, right? Beauty for the sake of itself out of the experiences. That helps, Sarah? I can't see you nodding, sorry. Is she nodding? Can't see you're nodding up there either. Yes, <laughs> yes, I am. Thank you. <laughs> okay. That reminds me of Jane Austen. Some of the younger characters seem like they have that just wild love of beauty and sense and sensibility. And then as they grow up, they move toward that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, and, and this is uh, like a youthful expression of life and maybe not so bad as a youthful person to, to be an athlete, um, because in the plurality of experience, in the, the depths and waves of passion, one finds um, those principles that make us who we are, that, that make us happy, that satisfy um, the, that part of us, the like je ne sais thing, right? Um, that lives in us. And that thing often has to be sparked alive. And, and it's in youth, typically, that that does get sparked. Um, so to experience an adventure is to um, seek that spark. But once it's there, it's important to nurture and develop and kindle that spark into the ethical fire and then become resigned to it, have faith anyways, and become a knight of faith, which we'll talk about. Okay, so the ethical stage of life is characterized by one, a recognition of the universal and humankind. So this is to say that like we're all the same kind of thing, we're all humans, um, and that we're all a part of a community. We share this space in this world and we have an effect on one another, right? That, that, that we're um, interdependent uh, completely, that one action has a ripple and that action affects through its ripple other people. So we recognize ourselves as a part of the whole of humankind. Two, we understand social norms that uh, we, won't be duplicitous or uh, uh, you know, uh, two-faced or whatever in different social scenarios because it's rude and, and it's impolite and you're not being genuine to that next person um, that you're communicating with. Uh, and, and it's better to, to, um, to, to be honest, right? That, that there are certain social norms that we have a responsibility to satisfy them with one another. No Pierre the waiter. Though. No Pierre the waiter, yeah. Um, and three, how duty guides uh, and justifies actions aimed at benefiting the community, the universal, prior to the individual, the particular. So we prioritize, uh, at least idealistically, theoretically, um, doing the good for the community before doing the good for oneself. We call that narcissism or egoism or, um, you know, there's a bunch of words used as bad names for this kind of behavior. Um, and as we settle into our lives, you might think of um, the young person who goes out and, and has all sorts of fun, uh, finally settles and has a family and uh, recognizes the importance of that family and, and of their actions and the effects of those actions on that family. This is a small like microcosm of this universal or particular kind of relationship that when you settle into your life, you begin to you begin to lose uh, an acute sense of all of the possibilities that are open to you. 
and you begin to focus on what you're actually doing, what your life is actually consists in, and how it's important for you to satisfy the needs of that life that may be more than just you. And according to the ethical life is more than just you, it's your community, in this case, a family. So like your kid or something, right? Um, you don't go out and party every night um, because you have to feed the baby and change its diaper, right? That sort of thing. Um, small example, but think more universally, this sort of uh, ethical kind of um, lifestyle. And then finally, there is the religious. So for Kierkegaard, Christian faith is not a matter of regurgitating church dogma. Um, again, surprising that Kierkegaard wasn't taking a task too much, at least as far as I could find, because um, he wasn't a fan of dogma, dogmatism in the church, right? Um, I think he would accuse uh, priests of exhibiting bourgeoisie philistinism um, just as much as anybody else if they actually did. And I don't think he would shy away from that. Maybe why he used pseudonyms, right? He was afraid of like lash out from um, making these kinds of critiques. So it's a matter of individual subjective passion, um, that is faith, uh, which cannot be mediated by clergy or human artifacts. Um, faith is the most important task to be achieved by the human being to, to take the step, the movement of faith is a final achievement. Um, it is uh, to be like Abraham, a hero. Um, and it may only happen in moments, but to live consistently in it, that's to be a night of faith. Um, and it's important because it's only on the basis of faith that an individual has a chance of becoming their true self and remaining their true self too, right? That there is this like way that we are and we have to be authentic to it. We ought to be authentic to it. Um, and it's through faith that one can live both ethically and true to that thing that is related to the universal that is like God's will, right? Um, so we can both remain committed to an ethical life and resign ourselves to the impossibility of living a perfect ethical life through faith. And this is what it is to be religious. Um, so in the religious stage, one embodies uh, this passion, who they are, what makes them them um, through faith and unifies the aesthetic and the ethical, right? So through faith, through religious life, the two previous forms of life are unified. And you can't have a religious person who is not also at the same time an aesthete and uh, an ethical person, right? That um, it, they, they require one another. It's a development. It's a growth. It's not a, oh, the, the athlete is wrong. Let's not be like that. It's let's grow from it into this next stage. Okay. So Abraham and the binding of Isaac, there's no more important character in religious theology, according to Kierkegaard than Abraham, because Abraham represents the, the perfect ideal form of a night of faith of the person who lives a religious life consistently. Abraham is a night of faith. He represents the teleological suspension of the ethical. This is what he calls it in the second half of the book. This is the, the movement from uh, the ethical stage of life to the religious one where um, teleological means uh, ends for the sake of which, right? It's, it's the, the principles of, of and so uh, it's an Aristotelian term. Um, there are four kinds of causes according to Aristotle. There are material causes, efficient causes, uh, formal causes and final causes. Uh, so think of a block of marble. The block of marble is the material cause. Uh, the uh, efficient cause is the hammer and chisel. The formal cause is the idea that the artist has in uh, their mind as they're carving. And the, the final cause is kind of like a formal cause, but it's it means for the sake of which. So it was it, the marble exists for the sake of becoming the David, that it was built even before the marble became the David, uh, even before it was mined out of the earth, uh, there was um, uh, uh, the principle, the final end of becoming the David was present in that matter itself, according to Aristotle. Um, and so teleological is um, usurped and used in all sorts of other contexts outside of this like formal causation theory of causality stuff in Aristotle um, in his physics, that's where this happens. Um, and it just means like final causes. So when like we're talking about purpose, uh, destiny, you're speaking teleologically. So a teleological suspension of the ethical is to say, I'm suspending my ethical beliefs teleologically, like for the sake of some end, which is through faith and, and for the sake of the absurd, it's gonna turn out. Um, 
So Abraham is an exemplar of the religious, as Kierkegaard understands the term, insofar as Abraham receives God's saving grace by virtue of his faith in absurdity and uh, resignation, which I'll talk more about later, but I mean, just, you know, sort of drawing out the field of, of uh, concepts here, this is what Kierkegaard is getting at, though we won't know exactly what that means until we cover it. So why is this? Well, let's dig into the story of Abraham. So Abraham is uh, the father of all Abrahamic religions, um, meaning Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. Um, and Abraham is born in, like, I don't know what the name of the land that he's born in is, like somewhere around Ur or whatever, a really old Middle Eastern town. Um, and God says to, to Abraham, yo, uh, leave your family, get out of town, uh, take your wife with you, uh, give up your birthright, uh, and wander around the earth for a while, and I promise that I'll make you the father of nations. Now the Lord said unto Abram, because his name at this point is Abram, it's not Abraham. Um, his, he, his name becomes Abraham. God renames him, which is a theme that happens quite a lot in the Bible. Um, but he renames Abraham after making a pact with him and uh, allowing Isaac to be born from Sarah to Abraham. So God says unto Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I'll make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in all the families of the earth, you shall be blessed. So this is a picture of God making this covenant with Ab Abram. And Abram says, great, okay, I'll do it. And so he does it. But it turns out that Abram's gonna have to wait an entire century, nearly like 80 years before uh, this promise is fulfilled. Uh, he leaves his home, his family, his birthright to wander the earth, right? He goes to Egypt for a while. Uh, his, he, I don't know why, but he tells the Egyptian Pharaoh that his wife is his sister. So the Egyptian wife like takes the, the D D Egyptian Pharaoh takes his wife as his own wife. And then God's like, no, that's not cool. And then curses and like brings plagues to the Egyptians and the Pharaoh. It's like, what the hell, Abram? You told me that this woman was your sister. And He's like, oh, sorry. And he does it again, like later. It's so strange. I don't, I don't understand why that happens, but it does. Um, just part of the wanderings of, of uh, early Abraham. Um, during this time, Sarah, again, gives birth to no children. There, there's, uh, Abraham is supposed to be the father of nations, and yet he can't be father to any children at all. And so in despair, Sarah, then named Sarai, Sarai, um, she's renamed too, uh, tells Abraham to take her valley maid slave uh, after they leave Egypt, uh, the Pharaoh says, like, get the hell out of my town, but here, have some, like, cattle and uh, a couple of slaves. So um, uh, Sarah is given uh, a maidservant uh, slave, Hagar, um, and Sarah says, look, I can't give you a kid, and I know how much you want one, and, and I, like, feel awful, so please, like, take this woman and, and have a kid. And so he does, out of respect. He, he doesn't want to, but, like, Sarah, like, pleads and says, do it. Um, so Abraham agrees, and nine months later, Hagar gives birth to Abraham's firstborn son, the bastard Ishmael. Ishmael is the uh, founder of Islam. So Ishmael, uh, Islam traces back to, to Ishmael and Christianity and Judaism uh, uh, genealogically followed back to Isaac. Um, as soon as Ishmael's born, uh, Sarah sees how much um, Abraham loves his son, uh, and she becomes jealous. Uh, she didn't expect to become jealous, but she does. And so she, uh, she through Abraham, says, hey, banish these people. He's like, get them out of my sight. I can't, I can't deal with them here. And so Abraham uh, sadly says, hey, get out of here. Um, kicks him out. So Hagar and Ishmael now go wander the desert um, and uh, God saves them. And it's that it's then that like Ishmael is able to have a bunch of kids and um, found who found Islam eventually. So to sum up, Abraham is basically a really old homeless guy after like this promise who's wandering about from town to town. And he like collects some herds here and there, but um, he's, he's not like super wealthy he has wealth but he's not like 
king of nations, right? Father of, of uh, religions and people. Um, and he continues doing this for more than half a century out of faith, right? Uh, that even past the point of fertility, normal fertility, he continues to have faith that God will keep his promise. His only son is a bastard whose uh, sight his wife hates and so was banished. Um, and his wife are 80 plus years old, unable to conceive, right? They, they aren't gonna have a kid. Um, here they are. Um, but they don't despair, they remain in faith. And I think Isaac looks like this because he's about to be stabbed, it's just like not shown. Um, <laughs> had a hard time finding like actual art of just Isaac and it was all this. Yeah, so Isaac is, is only really famous for being almost killed, um, so it, which explains his concerned face. <laughs> he's, he's rightly concerned. So God gives Abraham and Sarah a trueborn son, finally. I, after, you know, he's like 88, I think, when Isaac is born. Um, and it's, it's here that like circumcision is invented and Abram becomes Abraham and, um, and God's like, all right, fine, you, you, you did it. Thank you for having faith in me. Have a kid. Um, and so Abraham and Sarah have Isaac, um, but their joy would not last long. After these things, God tested Abraham. And I have the passage here. Um, yeah. So he has, he makes this pact with Abraham, renames him. Uh, Abraham and Sarah have their kid. And then the very next passage in the Bible, after these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. So God finally fulfills his promise and is like, oh, wait, never mind. I actually kind of want you to burn that guy, that beautiful son of yours. Give me his life. And here's the binding of Isaac. So and this is a painting by Carvaggio, a really cool Renaissance painter. Um, and what I love most about it is Abraham's face. He's in anguish. And, and this is the moment where, where it's all stopped, right? Where, where the angel comes and says, whoa, <laughs> look at the lamb. Um, but he's not looking at the lamb, right? He's, he's not even surprised. He's so intensely wrought with despair in this painting it's really potent emotion um that even with like god's voice speaking through an angel that there's no release from the the dread that fills his whole life and being um really powerful so um as the story goes abraham takes his his two young servants his son isaac they leave sarah at the camp and uh three days he walks to the mountain on Moriah. Three days, he knows what's going to happen. Three days, he gathers wood and looks at the knife on his belt. Three days, he wakes up next to his son, Isaac. And Isaac doesn't know what's going to happen, but Abraham does. And for three days, he lives building up to the dread of this moment. He walks his son up the mountain, leaving his two slaves and their donkey behind. Uh, he bundles the wood and binds Isaac and raises the knife with the intent to kill. And at the moment that the knife gleams, the sun above his son's breast, he's about to bring it down. As we see pictured here, the angel stops him, says, whoa, 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 <laughs> hold your horses. There's a lamb in the bushes there, kill that instead. Um, and, uh, and so, Abraham stops and Isaac is spared and they burn the, the lamb to, um, as, as a sacrifice instead. And, uh, and just to give you the, the exact quote, um, Isaac said to his father, father, and he said, here I am. He said, the fire and the wood are here, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? So Isaac asks, like, what is going on, dad? 
Um, Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called him from heaven. And so, so I think this is a really important expression of, of like what's going on. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. This is active. This, is, this isn't like he picked up the knife in order to eventually, do, like he's, he is in the act of killing his son as he picks up the knife. This is the moment when he decides to follow through with God's will, that his son, his only son, his only true born son, at least, his most beloved promise, the reason that he wandered the earth for more than half a century, why he lived uh, homeless and uh, without family, why he gave up his birthright and his family and his homeland uh, for the word of God. And, and this is before like the word of God was the word of God, right? Like Abraham's the first one who's like, hey, we should listen to this guy up behind the sky. And he's the first one who does. And that's why he's like the father of the Abrahamic religions. Um, and, and on the, the, the promise of, of, of you know, God um, gives up everything and is willing to even give up that representation of what he did it all for. Um, And, and after the angel saves him, um, God responds and says, uh, by myself, I have sworn because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you. And I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of the enemies. And by your offspring shall all the nations of the earth gain blessings for themselves because you have obeyed my voice. And so in response to this test, right, Abraham decides to kill his son despite being unable to kill his son, right? The most beloved thing to him in all of his life is to be sacrificed and he goes through with it, um, but is stopped. And it's because he satisfies this test that God says, okay, now I will fulfill the promise. You thought I did it before when I gave you Isaac, but really I was waiting for this. I was waiting for the most complete form of uh, faith and you have done it, you've achieved it. And so your sons will always have the gates of the enemies, they'll take their towns and um, they will now actually be the, the father of nations. And this is the binding of Isaac. Now, interesting note, um, in Islamic traditions, this is often called the binding of Ishmael, right? So Ishmael is uh, traded out for Isaac in uh, some versions of the Quran. So in early versions, it's like 130 versus 133. Um, some of those early versions of the Quran say it's the binding of Isaac, and some of them say it's the binding of Ishmael, though in modern day Islam, it is accepted as the binding of Ishmael. So kind of cool, right? That it's, it's a different binding, a different... Uh, object of sacrifice to represent faith um, based on like the tradition of, of theology from which, you know, the, the um, tradition derives the, the family line. Okay, so we read the first half. Oh, I didn't, oh, okay, good. In the first half of the book, Kierkegaard describes uh, several lovely interpretations of the binding of Isaac. Did you guys read the, um, those first like few aphorisms, like paragraphs of Kierkegaard tells the story of the binding of Isaac in like five different ways. They are awesome. It's the best part of the whole reading. And I made it optional. Um, it Go back. It'll take you 15 minutes if you didn't do it. Um, it's awesome. Um, totally worth doing. Like don't waste time on Facebook. Read that and then waste time on Facebook. Um, they're fantastic. Uh, and then we get the, the problem of ethical duty when constrained or conflicted by the will of God, right? This is Kierkegaard's expression of the, the problem of being. Um, we get a description of resignation to suffering and uh, pain and unhappiness, the leap of faith uh, through and into the absurd, and a full characterization of the knight of faith who moves beyond the ethical infinite resignation of existence to a religious salvation through the absurd. Abraham is a knight of faith uh, who overcomes ethical anxiety through faith. But what does this mean? Okay, so 
here's Kierkegaard looking like Sartre. If faith cannot make it a holy act to be willing to murder one's son, then let the same judgment be passed upon Abraham as upon everybody else. The ethical expression of what Abraham did is that he intended to murder Isaac. So from the ethical point of view, he's murdering his son. That's, that's a moral claim. That's very normative, murder. The religious expression is that he intended to sacrifice Isaac. So sacrifice has different, uh, a different connotation than murder. Murder is senseless. Murder is, um, I want you dead for the sake of not, you're not living anymore. Sacrifice is, I want you dead for the sake of honoring God, the universal. Um, but in this contradiction, the contradiction between murder and sacrifice, because Abraham is, I mean, Abraham is murdering his son. Look at his face. He, he is, his knife is about to kill him, his son. He's, he's going to murder the guy. Um, that is not the face of someone performing a sacrifice. It's the face of, of someone performing murder upon their son, a child, right? So Abraham is murdering Isaac, but he's also sacrificing Isaac. And this is a contradiction because the one is justified sacrifice, right? Through faith, spirituality, whatever. The other is not, the other is abhorrent, right? And it's in this contradiction um, that uh, uh, Abraham experiences anxiety. But in this contradiction lies precisely the anxiety that indeed can make a person sleepless. And yet Abraham is not who he is without his anxiety. Abraham went his whole life. He wandered the, the, the earth for 60, 80 years, um, homeless, uh, gave up his youth and his fertility, his family, his homeland, all of this um, for a promise that was never fulfilled, or at least it took a long time for it to be fulfilled. Um, this is an anxious state. And anxiety is a term of art for Kierkegaard. Um, so here's like picking out the important bits. The ethical and the religious are put into contradiction. And in the state of contradiction, we have the state of anxiety. And importantly, Abraham is who he is because of his anxiety. Um, and it's going to turn out his overcoming of anxiety through the movements of faith. Um, but we need to understand what anxiety is in order to understand what Kierkegaard means by the, the problem of being that inspires the movements of faith and, and Abraham himself. So anxiety, nausea, dread, angst, ambiguity. These are all terms that are shared by existentialists, um, or I shouldn't say shared. They all use these terms, right? But slightly differently. Um, so like existentialism, um, yeah, existentialism, scare quotes, um, each of these have their own like specific definitions, right? Depending on who's talking about them. Um, Beauvoir's ambiguity is very similar to uh, Camus' absurd. It's very similar to Sartre's nausea, um, similar to uh, Heidegger's uh, angst or uh, Kierkegaard's anxiety, right? But also like existentialism, scare quotes, uh, the definitions orbit around a similar experience, right? They're, they're all kind of pointing at the same thing, S similar stuff at least. At, in fact, this guy's face, right? Isn't that expressive, right? Yeah, I, I had stared at this one for a while. It was kind of freaked me out. Um, and, and like a, not in a like, oh God, no, like wait, but like a intense, but eliciting an intensity of experience that isn't, Typical, normal, right? That, that sort of experience. Right? So for Sartre, nausea is the experience of realizing that our consciousness of objects has no existence in the objects themselves, which we'll talk about when we get to Sartre. Um, and so we become entirely estranged from reality that I'm in here and not out there, but everything that's in here is about out there. That's an experience of nausea. Um, for Sartre in his novel, Nausea, uh, the first experience that we see of this, like that's really explicit, is the main character looking at himself in the mirror. And I'm sure we've all had this experience. You look at yourself in the mirror and you see yourself not as yourself because you see yourself as an object, right? You're seeing the object part of you, but you are this other stuff, this like spirit that this thing that lives as will and thought and consciousness. Um, and, and then you're looking at yourself in the mirror and you see your, your, your object self as not involving any of that. And, and then how alone you become even from yourself, right? This is nausea. Anxiety for Heidegger 
uh, is an experience of the world no longer working for you, right? That we operate with assumptions that um, this is a rectangle, right? For instance, anxiety is when you think, is this a rectangle? What does that mean, right? Say you like say the same word over and over and over and over and it starts to like, whoa, you know, you, you get that sense of um, separation of object from meaning. This is anxiety for Heidegger, but in like an active sense, when we're living in the world and the world stops working as, as we think it should, um, think like really bad trip, you know? Um, someone is way out there. Um, and this is the anxiety is, is the, the inability of the world to satisfy the, the setup and system of, of needs and uh, interactive understanding that, that we have. Um, the world becomes intelligible. And in that space between existence and uh, the unworkable, what he calls president hand, um, the world when it is objectified as president hand, when it works for us, it's being, being in hand. Um, uh, there's a growing sense of absolute nothing. We, we become aware of the, the absolute nothingness that is between object and meaning and the space in between is where anxiety is felt. For Kierkegaard, anxiety is, and this is a quote, freedom's actuality is the possibility of possibility. Um, so before I go on, who wants to guess what that means? Freedom's actuality is a possibility of possibility. Nobody. Sounds kind of like faith. Yeah, it'll have something to do with faith. Um, so here's what he means by this. Um, the experience of freedom, it's way to our responsibility and accountability. This is like, like in experiencing what freedom is, recognizing that, that we have it, one feels anxiety. So here's his example. You look over a cliff and you think, and, and you see it like, you know, like, like, I don't know if you guys do this on hikes. I, I'm, I do. I'm kind of a junkie for adrenaline. Um, so like, I'll go like sit at the cliff or like lean over it and like look down. And I, I the, the feeling of love is the wrong word for it, but um, maybe a, another better word will come to me, but the experience of at least looking over the cliff and then watching the ground kind of like disappear away. This is what Kierkegaard means by freedom. The, the, uh, experience of freedom's actuality is a possibility of possibility. So th th there's a possibility of jumping, right. right? And there's a possibility of not jumping, right? So, so the, the actuality of a possibility as a possibility, that's what this means. The possibility of jumping becomes an actuality. Like I'm looking down and I'm seeing like, oh, I could do that, right? Um, and, and there's this like co-instantiation of, of contradictory feelings of, oh God, no, I, I'm not gonna do that. And um, uh, you know, what if? right? And there's always that feeling. So similar, this is like a recorded psychological effect too. Like when somebody hands you a baby, you, you think I better not eat this baby across the room, yeah. right? But you think I could eat this baby across the room, right? Um, one ought not eat babies. That is not part of the religious style of life that Kierkegaard is, is suggesting. Um, though if God willed it, then you, you would, and then be saved. You eat a lamb across the room instead. Um, but this is the feeling of anxiety for Kierkegaard, right? Is the uh, feeling of possibility becoming actuality, not actuality like, like I can possibly knock the table. That's an actuality of a possibility, but that's an actuality actually happening, if that makes sense. Is that clear? Like it's, I'm using the same words over and over, so it could be a little convoluted, but like good, thumbs up, yeah. Okay, cool. If you don't understand, then I'm sorry, ask a question in chat. Great. Um, so fear and trembling. If faith cannot make it a holy act to be willing to murder, oh, I said this already, didn't I? Um, so anxiety, again, is what Abraham feels in this contradiction of ethical and religious, right? Um, that uh, Abraham has existed for decades in this state of anxiety, in the state of contradiction between his spiritual affirmation of the promise of God, his faith in God, and his ethical, human, very human uh, convictions. I should, you know, love my wife. I should uh, not sleep with my wife's slave and have a kid, but, you know, like in despair, they, they do so anyways. Um, I should 
uh, not murder my son, et cetera, right? That these ethical convictions and the religious ones have always been in contradiction in Abraham's life and, and this is his anxiety. So this meme is just making fun of the fact of his pseudonyms. Like he, his arguments involve, all, especially in the second half of this book are like all sorts of strange contradictions. He just like repeats it over and over as if repetition is supposed to like make you get it. Um, and then, you know, why would a pseudonym do this? Stupid pseudonym, Johannes de Salentio. Okay, so what did Abraham actually have faith in, right? So if, if ethical conviction makes enough sense, because it's the most human part of Abraham, don't murder your son, um, what did he have faith in that allowed him to, at the same time, will the, the sacrifice of his son? But what did Abraham do, asks Kierkegaard? He arrived neither too early nor too late. He mounted the ass and rode slowly along the way. Three days, right? During all this time, he believed. He believed that God would not demand Isaac of him, which he was still willing to sacrifice him if it was demanded. He believed by virtue of the absurd, for human calculation was out of the question. And it was indeed absurd that God, who demanded it of him, in the next instant would revoke the demand. He climbed the mountain, and even at the moment when the knife gleamed, he believed that God would not demand Isaac. In contradiction with his belief that he must do it because God demanded it, right? This is the anxiety. This is what Abraham has faith in. Abraham's faith that God would not demand it in spite of the fact that God is demanding it. Is there scriptural reference of that? Like, uh, he says that he doesn't believe God's going to ask him to actually do it. Um, no, this, this, yeah, this is Kierkegaard. Um, let me skim it real quick, though, just see. Um, I mean, when I read that, I was curious because it seemed like it's based on the faith that he has had for all of those years. So it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like that he would think that God would be not ask him to do it this whole time. All right. He's been believing for 80 years, like holding to that belief that God's going to do what he says he's going to do. Why would he then infer that he's going to arrive in three days thinking he's not going to be expected to do what he asked him to do? Yeah. It seems a contradiction for the whole, his yeah. whole existence. So I, I think this is a good question. Um, and, and I wonder if you could interpret it out of this. It's, the way I read this is really methodical. He rises early. He uh, gets his donkey. He gets his two servants. He gets Isaac. They walk. He wakes up. He takes three days. He bundles the sticks. It's like, like, almost like the stranger, right? It's just like facts, right? It's descriptions of what's yeah. happening. Um, and uh, and it's even a description at the end when Abraham reached out the hand to take the knife to kill his son. Um, but no, this is, this is Kierkegaard's interpretation. And so I, I skipped putting this part of the content in the lecture, but I'm glad you're asking um, because Kierkegaard, before he discusses the night of faith, as he's discussing Abraham in the beginning of the reading, he... Um, he plays with the idea of different interpretations of, of Abraham and says that we can interpret Abraham as uh, being just a murderer or just sacrificing. You can, you can make Abraham out to be like any other man, any other human, right? Um, and if you do so, uh, then I don't want to listen to you anymore, says Kierkegaard. Um, what the, where you get the real complete power of the story where Abraham becomes the hero that he truly is, um, is where he supersedes his humanity with his faith and that you don't get that, um, that like transcendence of ego, uh, uh, the, the teleological suspension of the ethical into the, the religious without the interpretation that Kierkegaard provides. So, so he does like a little bit of, um, uh, uh, what, what's it called? Um, I think sliding scale argument is wrong, but the idea is like you give two options and you say, well, this is not right. And this is not right. Um, so we're like, we're operating on the wrong kind of dichotomy. So we got to like give a new way through to the problem. That's the, the like form of his argument there. Um, though it is like lyrical and he's being all like poetic and stuff saying, you know, you stupid person, I wouldn't listen to you, right? He's, he is actually constructing somewhat of an argument there, um, giving uh, reason to accept his interpretation for want of the others. Does that help? Yeah. But, but yeah, I, I think it's, it's a good point. I, I, I don't think um, 
that you could interpret that straight out of the methodical reading of, of that passage, um, not without some creativity. Clinton. So I'd hate to get into like a semantic discussion, but is this certainty despite absurdity or is it certainty because of absurdity? It's certainty in absurdity, which we'll see. Okay. So, so it's not like in spite of, the, the absurdity is the thing that you like have faith in. You open yourself up through faith to the absurd, um, which we'll see in a moment. Um, it's not like because of, so, so because of the absurd, Ivan resigns himself, right? right. Um, but it's because of the absurd that Abraham has faith and thus is like receives Isaac, but we'll, we'll get there. Okay. So Abraham believed that, again, this is a quote from Kierkegaard, through God, all things are possible. In spite of the fact that this demanded a contradiction, it was possible to will both the death and persistence of his son through God and not persistence in heaven, right? Not like Isaac is going to go to heaven and, and live up there with God, but like persistence on this earth. Because that's what his fatherly instincts, that's what, like who he is as, as a man like, committed to being and being with his son. That's, that's what it is that he cares about, right? He doesn't, I mean, you, you, you care, religious or, or re any religious person cares about the persistence of their child in heaven, like, you know, like living on in, in the Beatific vision, having uh, the experience of heaven and, and God's grace, et cetera, right? Every religious parent wants that for their kid, but they also want the best life for their kid, not just life after death for their kid. If they didn't, they wouldn't, you know, cry awful tears of sorrow at the funerals of their children, right? It's like terrible um, to die before your, or for your kid to die before you, because your whole life is about them, is for them, for the sake of, right? Teleologically, you, you put yourself for the sake of this thing. And so Abraham similarly isn't trying to like see his son dead, but just doing what God demands. And so Abraham's acceptance and likewise equanimity, though equanimity, remember his concerned face, his awful face. Um, and this state of contradiction is what Kierkegaard calls the movements of faith. So the movements of faith. Faith is a two-step process. Um, oh, it's going to repeat every time. I, oh, well. Um, there is first the infinite resignation of the ethical and second, a teleological suspension of the ethical um, through religious reception of the absurd. So we'll get to see the full dance now. So you read the quote. Abraham resigned him everything infinitely and then grasped everything again by virtue of the absurd. It is supposed to be the most difficult task for a dancer to leap into a particular posture in such a way that there is no second uh, when he grasps at the position but assumes in the lead itself. Perhaps no dancer can do it, but that knight does, the knight of faith, Abraham. The majority of people live absorbed in worldly sorrow and joy. They are wallflowers who do not join in the dance. The knights of infinity are dancers and have their own elevation. So the idea is... Um, when, say, a uh, ballet dancer pirouettes, right? A pirouette is a movement, right? But it's a movement that expresses a form, um, a turning, a rotation with a particular um, expression of the body. And so what Kierkegaard is saying is like, this active movement finds crystallization. It finds a certainty and a determination in spite of its necessarily ending. And so the movement of faith, this... Um, infinite resignation, which we don't know yet, and this movement of faith, which we also don't know yet, play together to um, cause the, the, what is always moving to find a static crystallization in the, the metaphor of dance, right? It, it's gonna look different in Abraham's, but it's like the, the working of a contradiction, right? It's how the contradiction finds um, satisfaction. Okay, so what is infinite resignation, this first movement of faith? Infinite resignation is giving up what is most beloved to you so as not to contradict who you are. Our souls are, with concentration and strength, it's hard to focus this way, able to, entire, to be entirely independent and unaffected entities, stoics in this kind of sense, that, that we don't, like Sartre, like when I talked about Sartre's nausea, um, our consciousness of objects is always in here and not out there in, in objects themselves. Um, we are who we are 
And the Knight of Faith is so unabashedly and for the sake of what they are. Um, and that they're uncompromising in their individuality, right? Um, and to, to compromise is to be in bad faith, to be unauthentic, to be disingenuous to oneself. Um, as Kierkegaard says, deeper natures never forget themselves and never become anything other than what they were. So we resign ourselves to the world of suffering in spite of our high moral ideas of utopia and happiness. This is the first movement, right? We, we like Isaac, Ivan, say, um, I have all of these great ideas the way that the world should be, but it is not. Children suffer. Innocence is lost. Um, but I will not compromise myself. I will not compromise these moral ideals that I have that I know are good and right for the sake of some promise of harmony, for the sake of uh, heaven, for the sake of uh, salvation through Christ, right? Um, I return my ticket. Ivan is the knight of infinite resignation, the, the embodiment of this first movement of uh, faith. We know what we can be, but there's only so much that can be done, right? We want to see the world perfect. We want to live our dreams, but the best we can do is who we are. So we resign ourselves to our individuality in an existence that calls for love and community. Resigned, we seek love and community, though we remain resigned to it. And here's where Kierkegaard gives the example of the, the like lover in the night and the, the lover falls in love, but doesn't like, like uh, uh, absorb himself in his lover. Uh, he, he says, be free, you know, and you know, if it loves you, it'll come back, right? That's what they say. That's what Kierkegaard is saying about the, the love of the night of faith. The, the night of faith falls in love and then walks away and is like, see you later actually meaning see you later, you know, not just goodbye. Um, and then if the, the lover never returns, because the Knight of Faith is resigned to the love, the Knight of Faith is able to remain himself without being like so torn up and, you know, like uh, crying and eating ice cream for weeks and weeks, right? Um, but likewise is still open to the receipt of that love. And so if the, the lover is likewise individually inclined a night of faith and they come back together then their love is a story for the ages princess bride right that's actually the story of a princess bride so i have a quick question and i not to be one of the bourgeois philistines but he does say that for what is worthwhile remembering the past that cannot become a present right so i'm wondering if there's a intrinsic difference between the night of faith and Abraham's situation, because Abraham is promised all these things by God, whereas the night of faith, it doesn't seem like God is making these promises actively to the people. Is that an issue for him? Um, I don't know. Uh, so I don't know all of Kierkegaard that well. I don't know if you're in Tremling, but enough times. But I would guess that, Kierke so if I'm going to like play Kierkegaard here and answer your question, here's how I would do it. Uh, and you know, I don't mean to be committed, committing Kierkegaard to this answer, but you know, so I think he might. Um, God does make a promise to each of us, and that is through the, the Christian theology, right? And you ought not to be a slave to the dogmas of Christian theology, but still recognize that in those doctrines are promises of God for salvation and for uh, a kingdom of heaven on earth, for the return of uh, the Son of God on all that stuff, right? Um, that these promises are... Um, writ in scripture uh, and, uh, and are for all of us, right, to, to find salvation. And so um, th there's where you get like a Christian universality kind of thing. Can you, can you also see that lack of uniformity of, from past to present as an absurdity that also has to be overcome, I guess? Or accepted, yeah, in contradiction. Um, and, and I think there's, there's another thing to say here, and, and I'll just mention it because, again, I'm not like a Kierkegaard scholar, um, but I think there's something in the development of the three stages, right? Where you go from the aesthete to the ethical to um, the religious, that the past is a part of the, the retained aesthetic nature, that in the memory of the past, one continues to be what one is. And the past has this sort of like centrist quality and memory and so I, I think there's something to do with it there, that you're not just like giving up all of this other stuff, all, all the rest of your life, the, the rest of who and what you are and what you were, um, 
it just transfigures itself through ethical resignation and then eventually um, uh, religious uh, uh, spirituality for what that's worth. Um, so in resigning our individuality to, um, for, for, for the sake of love and community, it would be better to give up our attachments, but in the finitude of life, we need to grasp on all we can, right? Um, Got to eat bread when you're hungry. So the night of infinite resignation resigns themselves infinitely. Um, like Ivan is resigned to the problem of evil. Okay, so hold on. I'm going to like stop the share and take my screenshot. So if you're not using your camera, you should turn it on now. You have about like one second to do it. <laughs> okay. And now if you're here and you want to leave, you can but should not do so. <laughs> may, may, I, um, may I make a comment? Yeah, sure. Um, in, in the Bible somewhere, I wish I, I had it, but um, Abraham's history is that his father was a, an evil priest who wanted to sacrifice him. Oh, well, that's interesting. Yeah, so he, I, I read- He saw that as evil and he ran from that, the human sacrifice thing and sought God who to him represented the opposite of that. But that's very interesting with this idea of infinite resignation and um, giving up everything uh, to stand independently, that some sense of authenticity that's separate even from, you know, I thought that was very interesting. The definition of, eth of probably spirituality and religion and ethicalness to Abraham was probably the opposite of his being like his father uh, you know, a human sacrificing priest. I d and I then he got to do the same. It's just very absurd, you know. I don't see that here. So I, I read most of Genesis to prep for this lecture. Um, I, I, skipped, I skipped ahead to the Abraham part, um, which is Genesis 12. But I'm looking at 11. I don't see sacrifice. Yeah, I've, I've had that in a, a Bible study uh, kind of thing before where they brought out that he what his i'll have to see if i can find that but it was anyway it was interesting to me because that's really an independent that would be a very independent path to take to walk that line of being like your father when yeah. you led that but after I'll leaving to see if i have some corroborating uh information to <laughs> share next time yeah it'd be cool if you find it please share it Um, okay, now I gotta like open the chat again. Okay. Is this working? No, it's not. Is this working? Yes. Okay. Like Ivan is resigned to the problem of evil. Next slide. Great. Okay. So we resign ourselves infinitely. What's this about? Uh, what's this about? Kierkegaard uh, is the enemy of what he calls bourgeoisie philistinism, which is just stopping at infinite resignation or mostly resignation, probably mostly resignation, not infinite resignation. I think infinite resignation has a kind of like power that comes with it that would naturally lead oneself to um, a movement, the, the next movement of faith, but maybe not, I could just be imagining that. Um, so to stop uh, at infinite resignation is to be a Philistine, right? To like deny culture and aesthetic power and to be sort of a cynic about society and people and love and values and all that stuff, right? So um, it's a kind of reductive materialism. It's when you say all there is in the world is the world. We're nothing. We, we don't got souls. We're just a, a bunch of hunks of flesh moving around, feeling stuff sometimes, hoping it's mostly good. Um, and, uh, and that's that. So uh, when we work together, we should just do what we can to satisfy those mostly good desires of our um, social communal needs. Um, communists are often uh, reductive materialists. Um, there, there are different branches and kinds of communism, but reductive materialism is often a central component of uh, like a post-Marxist, neo-Marxist um, uh, political uh, uh, view. Um, though it need not be like bad, right? I say that because it is actually like a feature of these views um, and a big one um, because they're utilitarians, right? That it, you, you look at even the architecture of um, communists and uh, it's very utilitarian because they're trying to give everybody like 
enough space to live and survive and stuff. Um, so they're reductive materialists in not necessarily a bad way, maybe. Um, okay, so as Kierkegaard says, it is essential that infinite resignation is not to be a one-sided result of a cruel necessity. Right? Think of the Grand Inquisitor, cruel necessity, infinite resignation. And certainly the more this is granted, the more dubious it always becomes whether the movement is proper. Thus, if one thinks that a cold, barren necessity, a cold, barren necessity necessarily must be granted, one implies thereby that no one can experience death before actually dying, which strikes me as a crass materialism. And so what Ivan says is my Euclidean mind cannot accept it. Should in the infinite span of things parallel lines cross, I would not accept it. Right? Here's two completely opposing quotes, right? That um, Kierkegaard is accusing the kind of character that Ivan is of being unimaginative, not going far enough. That if we accept the absurd conclusion that parallel lines do cross, then all will be well and, harm and harmonious in time. But Ivan refuses to accept. He is a knight of infinite resignation without making the next movement of faith. So what does Kierkegaard say to someone like Ivan? Well, he says, infinite resignation is the last stage before faith. So that whoever has not made this movement does not have faith. And of course, Ivan doesn't. He rejects faith. I hand my ticket back. For only in infinite resignation do I become transparent to myself in my eternal validity. And only then can there be talk of laying hold of existence by virtue of faith. Right? And so I think this is an important um, thing to note that, that according to Kierkegaard, Ivan is failing to take that final step. And Ivan and his world are transparent, but cruelly so, right? A cruel necessity has taken hold of Ivan, and he's unable to see the next step that Kierkegaard is offering, right? Um, and Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky are producing work around the same time, too. So, so they're like in the same social intellectual spirit, the same zeitgeist, um, to use another Hegelian term. Um, and and where Dostoevsky um, doesn't take the leap of faith, denies faith, and in that way, like, has his strange spiritualism, his strange, like, religiosity, Kierkegaard is, is encouraging us to do so, right? So, so it's this, like, parallel problem, but different solutions, the Grand Inquisitor versus the movement of faith. So the absurd does not belong to the distinctions that lie within the proper compass of the understanding. The understanding here meant in the Kantian sense, which is um, the uh, like cognition, just all cognitive, the way that mind interacts with the world is the understanding, um, as broadly construed as you can imagine. Um, it is not identical with the improbably, improbable, the unforeseen, the unexpected. The moment the night resigned, he assured himself of the impossibility, humanly speaking, that was the conclusion of the understanding, and he had enough energy to think it. And in an infinite sense, however, it was possible by resigning it, but the possessing of possibility, you see, and this should sound to us like the definition of freedom, right? Actualizing the possibility, right? Um, in an infinite sense, however, it's possible by resigning it, this possessing of an actuality of a possibility, the expression of freedom, you see, is also a relinquishing of it, it's giving it up. Yet this possessing is no absurdity to the understanding for the understanding continued to be right in maintaining that in the world of the finitude, finitude where it rules and it was remained and it was and remained an impossibility. The night of faith is clearly conscious of this as well. Consequently, the only thing that can save him is the absurd. And he lays hold by faith of it by faith. He therefore acknowledges the impossibility and at the same moment believes in the absurd. So here's what this means. This is a lot. And this is a really important, this is like where the conclusion, of the, what the conclusion of, of his um, rambling is. He's saying, look, to be resigned to the ethical and yet recognize the importance of it, the universality of it, um, to be in a position of uh, both murdering and sacrificing your son, this is a contradiction. The understanding, our mind can't comprehend that. Our minds do not have the capacity to go far enough to see the parallel lines cross. The understanding it is, is only able to resign ourselves to the fact of this contradiction. And that's all it can do. But if one wants to move beyond the contradiction, one can use the absurd, that contradiction itself, through faith to receive uh, 
God's grace and salvation or, or whatever it is, right? To, to receive the lamb in the, in the bramble. Um, because the understanding cannot make this jump, it requires a movement of faith, which is faith in the absurdity. The absurdity is this condition that God has given us in being, by being beings that we are, um, that um, here we are, and uh, we live a contradiction. That contradiction is absurd, so have faith in it and take that next step or take that leap, right? So the night of faith takes a leap of faith, jumping out into the abyss, jumping into the empty swirl of contradiction, of absurdity, of infinite resignation, and finds there in this picture, it's not there, right? I chose this one really deliberately because there's no bottom and there's no other cliff, right? This is a leap of faith. It is not, it's suicide, but it's also flying. And in faith, the night of faith jumps and accepts and opens oneself to the contradiction of this suicidal flight and is caught by God. That's what Kierkegaard is telling us. That's how we cope with the absurd. We accept it. We open ourselves to it. We have faith in it. And thus we will be saved. So by faith, Abraham did not renounce Isaac, but by faith, Abraham received Isaac. I love this sentence. I think it's so expressive. Um, I think it's a really clear, succinct conclusion, a, a description of, of all that's come, right? Um, that Isaac or Abraham doesn't um, resign himself to the death of Isaac, but is receiving Isaac by resigning himself to what must be to the contradiction and then having faith in God in spite of that, by opening himself up to the absurd, God says, all right, you passed the test. Now you can be the father of nations. Abraham's a knight of faith. He renounces and resigns himself to the sacrifice of his most beloved son, thereby opening himself up through faith in the absurd to willfully believe also that through God, all things are possible. So what is the content of the movement of faith? Well, to suspend one's judgment of the ethical for the sake of the universal. Um, this has a Hegelian background and this is like Kierkegaard doing a Hegelian thing with himself. Um, I don't really understand the, the motions of the dialectic. I'll do my best to like give him in a word. Um, but Hegelianism has to do with what I've called dialectic, which is the synthesis of thesis and antithesis idea and its opposite um, in the understanding spirit, both individually and sociopolitically. And it inspired Marx. And Marx says, look, the end of history is communism because that's the social dialectic. It's where it ends up. So themes include somehow the unification of the particular with the whole in the movement of faith. And that's what he develops in the second half of the book that we won't talk too much about. So that's the end. Next week, we'll have our second reading group meeting of the plague. So read part one and two if you haven't read yet or just part two if you read part one. Um, we'll do that right after lecture. Uh, so if you'd like to take part, we had two, three people stay behind last time. I mean, about an hour, chatted about some class stuff and then the plague and um, as we get deeper into the book, it'll get more interesting and it's already like really relevant to like everything we experienced with COVID. So it's been pretty cool. Um, that'll be next week after class. Uh, we'll also be reading Nietzsche. I'll post the readings on Canvas shortly. I'm going out of town this weekend. I'm going to go camping in Escalante. So I'll be like out of email. Um, and I didn't bring my Nietzsche books with me to campus. So I have to like go home and come back and then make copies and stuff. So um, it might be kind of late tonight. Maybe we'll see. Um, and then I'm also going to do a survey. I do this for all of my classes mid-semester. So we're about halfway through now after next week. Um, so I'll distribute a survey to see like what works, what doesn't, what you guys like, what I could do better and um, what I should like keep doubling down on. Um, so yeah. Uh, Is we'll the PowerPoint going to be up? Are you going to upload that on Canvas? Yeah. Um, I would have done it before class, but I was frantically finishing it before class. So um, yeah, uh, it'll be up. I can do that in like the next 10 minutes. What uh, the Nietzsche reading for this week, which books are from? Um, I haven't decided which exact, I, I have like a whole bunch in mind and I don't want to give too much. So mo the biggest chunk of reading is going to be from the Untimely Meditations from Schopenhauer's Educator. It's my favorite personal, personal favorite um, piece from Nietzsche. Um, and it, it's a, it's early Nietzsche. So it's really clear. It's when he's like still in the academy and um, hasn't, gone like off the deep end on his own 
stylistic um, stuff yet, but we will read some of that too. I think what we'll read is um, The Madman from The Gay Science, which is where you get the famous quote, uh, God is dead, haven't you heard? Um, we'll probably read On Redemption from Thus Big Zarathustra and then selections that I pick out from Schopenhauer's Educator. And these all paint a story about the problem of nihilism and Nietzsche's response to it. And Nietzsche will be directly different, like the night and day from Kierkegaard. Uh, not, maybe not in writing style, like they're both poetic people, but Kierkegaard is like Christian and Nietzsche is atheist, right? So now we're, we're like flipping back. Okay, so we've dealt with the absurd um, through a, an increasing degree of faith. And now what happens when there's no faith at all? How do we cope with, um, or how do we at least avoid nihilism, which is the alternate response to um, absurdity? not construed that way in Nietzsche, but you know, for the sake of the class, that's the sort of conversation. Great, okay, I'm gonna stop the recording. Goodbye, future people. <laughs>